not through short lectures, we focus on what we can control in organizations, our behavior and our competency in work groups. We all have natural different attributes, our strengths and our weaknesses. However, there isn't a single trait or skill at being a positive team member and professional that all of us can't develop. The way to think about a lot of this material is by really, really carefully and critically reflecting on our own tendencies, experiences we've had with other people, and then focusing on developing our skills in organizational communication, just like we do with our skills in any other aspect of our work life, like writing, visual design, and so on. So let's start with the most basic level, our traits. Trait theory is a description and analysis of different traits that make up more and less effective team members and employees have been studied for just about a century. Early assumptions were that these traits were just part of who we were, that they couldn't really change. We now know that's not really the case. So let's take a look at some of the traits that most affect our work relationships, both positively and negatively. Let's take a look at our first member trait, dogmatism. This refers to a commitment to a very rigid belief structure. Those people who are highly dogmatic are also likely to reject other ideas and often people who lie outside of their own belief structures. If we think about this rigidity, these are people who might be able to persevere through situations, but they're probably not going to be the greatest teammates, nor are they going to be likely to manage rapidly changing situations. These are people who are stuck in their own way of thinking and unwilling to concede that there might be other possibilities out there. The second trait that we'll look at is the willingness to communicate. This is important because it's what enables work to get done in a very practical sense. So by willingness to communicate, we're referring to how readily people participate in class, team, group, or any other professional situation when given the opportunity that you say your piece and that you say it clearly and effectively. This is an important trait to develop because it's essential for organizations to be able to make the best decisions possible. They need people to speak up and to participate in the decision-making process. In fact, the willingness to communicate and demonstrate good team and interpersonal communication skills is so important that it's becoming a regular part of the job screening process where the group interviews and prospective employers want to see how effectively applicants are working in groups, being willing to take the lead, and engage with people they don't know. Additionally, there's a lot of research and experience that says that those people who are less willing often feel a sense of social alienation from the rest of their group. But the thing is, there can be a lot of reasons that people aren't willing to speak up in groups. They might feel introverted, they may feel like there's that it's just something they're not good at, they may have low self-esteem, they may feel different, they may also feel not valued. So if we go back to the invitational rhetoric, one of the reasons to create a positive environment is so that people feel like they can participate and be heard in an effective way, especially to draw out those who might not naturally be as willing to get, jump in to the conversation. The good news about work in small groups and in your classes, and this is a not so subtle hint is that the more that you interact within a particular group, the more you're likely to feel comfortable and this contribute more and then overall be more willing and develop this as a trait. During skills, it's a great skill to practice. During classes, excuse me, it's a great skill to practice. Even if you're outside your comfort zone, try and speak up at least once in every class. Be seen, be engaged. It's an important soft skill and trait to develop. third trait that we'll talk about is argumentativeness. Now this one can be controversial and it's really important to separate being argumentative from being aggressive. Aggression is an antisocial behavior and it's often associated with being dogmatic. What I mean about being argumentative is that people are willing to take a position and explain or defend it, not to the point that we're willing to die on that hill, but being able to advocate for something that is important within an organizational setting is a key trait to develop, and it not only improves the potential for success of the individual, but of the organization as well. Now, there are a lot of other traits, but this gives you a sample of three of the key ones 
that should either be avoided in the case of dogmatism or developed in terms of the willingness to communicate and argumentativeness in professional settings. There's plenty of research and reading about different kinds of member traits. It's a good way to diagnose what you're good at and what you're less good at and trying to figure out what kinds of skills that you need to improve. The traits that we have often influence our role-related behaviors. So let's take a look more specifically at role-related behaviors. There are three major types of these. People can choose to behave in different ways. However, we're also constrained by our formal roles that we have within our groups or the structure of the larger organization to which we belong. The first of the role-related behaviors are those that are task-related. If this is a role behavior that you're enacting, then you're likely to be focused on the task at hand, thus managing information, managing the work of the group in some way. So you might be trying to initiate discussion, seek information or opinions from others, evaluating ideas contributed by other group members, providing summaries, coordinating different ideas, or even testing for consensus. All of these are very much focused on getting the task or getting the mission accomplished that the organization or your group is tasked with. The second type of role-related behaviors that we'll talk about are group maintenance behaviors. Here, you're concerned with the group's success as a group. So you have a commitment to making sure that the group can function. If you're enacting these kinds of behaviors, then you're likely to be trying to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to contribute to the discussion. You focus on standards for the group process like attendance. You may try to harmonize or compromise, encourage people. You can even do tension breakers through joking or dramatization. Anything that helps the group stay cohesive and functioning within itself. That is about reducing conflict and maximizing people's attention and identification with the work that the group is doing, but also with the group members themselves. The final type of role-related behaviors that I want to talk about are those, obviously, that we want to avoid, the process-hindering behaviors. These can either be task-connected or group maintenance, but they tend to be excessive behaviors that reflect an eye focus and not a group focus. They might include things that block participation, so you give a critique of an idea that's so harsh that your other members don't want to contribute for fear of getting the same kind of negative response. You might totally withdraw or you might focus on getting all the credit. You might try to dominate or plead for special interest or the exclusion of wanting to compromise. Anything that really holds back and, you know, it's the excessive class clownery where, where you take away from the ability to get things done. Not focusing on the tasks, focusing on yourself, focusing on attention on, you know, the bad weekend that you had or whatever it might be. Anything that we can do that takes away from the group's proper task or the group's identification with one another, those are process hindering behaviors. And not surprisingly, we do them on a lot of times unconsciously. It can be associated with dogmatism or with genuine ill will, but a lot of times it's simply that we're unaware of how we're affecting the rest of the group with a negative mood or whatever the case may be. When you put them together, these traits and the role-related behaviors, we've offered a short introduction to both of those, but you start to get a sense of what kinds of individual factors, what we do as individuals, that can really help and contribute to, to our organization and to a good positive atmosphere, and what can take, it away, can take away from it. So this starts a good dialogue, hopefully, as we start to get into different kinds of competencies and different types of agility that we can demonstrate as individuals.